Today is Thursday, April 23rd, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Lori London in Washington. Coming up, President Trump praises some states that are beginning to reopen while disagreeing with others doing it too soon. We don't want rebounds after all this death, death that we've suffered. Not work. I don't view work. I, I view it death. On the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the pandemic has led to cleaner air and water. But will it last? Also ahead, top hip hop stars stage a live stream concert to support New York healthcare workers. It's all on today's International Edition. U.S. coronavirus deaths topped 47,000 Wednesday after rising by a near record single day. From a day before, President Donald Trump on Wednesday applauded steps by a handful of Republican-led U.S. states to reopen their economies, but later during his daily briefing said that he told Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, a longtime supporter, that he disagreed with his plan to reopen certain businesses this month, saying it's too soon for spas, beauty salons, and tattoo parlors to reopen. I told the governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, that I disagree strongly with his decision to open certain facilities which are in violation of the phase one guidelines. Georgia has been struggling to increase testing for new coronavirus infections and to boost tracking of those in contact with infected people. Experts say without them, there is a huge risk of a quick rebound in illness. Georgia has ranked in the bottom 10 per capita in testing. About a half dozen U.S. states, mostly in the South, are loosening stay-at-home guidelines, allowing an array of non-essential businesses to reopen. President Trump earlier this week gave those states a show of support on Twitter. Despite the pain stay-at-home orders are having on Americans' lives, a new poll finds a strong majority of people favor tough coronavirus restrictions. AP correspondent Tim McGuire reports. An AP NORC Center for Public Affairs research poll finds that some 80% of those questioned remain in favor of the stay at home and social distancing restrictions in order to lessen the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Laura McCullough, a college physics professor in Wisconsin, says the virus remains a huge threat. We're still discovering how nasty it can be. So I want to see people staying at home for even longer. While more than 60% back the actions taken by the government in their area, a vocal 12% is demanding an end to the restrictions. Mishan Maddock with the Michigan Conservative Coalition says the restrictions have wiped out millions of jobs. It's an economic disaster for Michigan and people are sick and tired of it. Tim McGuire. Washington. While citizens are struggling with fears over feeding their families versus getting sick from the virus, state and local leaders are trying to find a balance. International Edition Steve Miller spoke to Dr. Jose Vasquez, Division Chief and Professor of Medicine for Infectious Diseases at Augusta University about how the balance can be struck between easing restrictions and preventing the spread of COVID-19. That's a good question. So I think there are several issues. Number one is I think we definitely would like to see the, you know, the curve flattening, uh, not only in new cases, but also in uh, deaths. Um, and I th the reason that's important is the main reason we went into lockdown was to prevent these, this gigantic surge into hospitals across the world, right? Um, and that appears to be happening in, I think, just about every hospital across the, certainly across the United States and across most parts of Europe and across most parts of the world. Now, now that we've been able to do that and bring down the surge and not overload the hospitals, we have to figure out uh, what to do to get uh, to some kind of uh, uh, normality, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, with these lockdowns. And and I think that's the next step. I think a lot of people forget that that was the reason we went into the lockdown, uh, besides the fact that we wanted to, you know, protect ourselves and protect the spread. But it really was to make sure that we didn't overwhelm the healthcare system anywhere. So, I mean, to follow up on that. So speaking about not wanting to overwhelm the healthcare systems. Yeah. How quickly should you roll back the restrictions so that you don't have a resurgence 
of the coronavirus infections or, or for that matter any contagion depends on the contagion so we'll go with coronavirus because obviously ebola would be very different right but you know that's a, that's probably the question and everybody across the world is looking for i don't have the answer to that except to say that i think now the public across the world is much better educated uh, as far as transmission of an infectious disease agent i think the population across the world doesn't want to get sick they don't want to die and we're, i think we are a lot smarter than what uh, most governments give us credit for if you will but i think now that we are into it a couple of months we know what we need to do this certainly will not be the last pandemic that the world faces so if you take a look at what we have learned in the let's say five six months since covid 19 first came to the stage where do we stand in, in terms of learning some lessons to better prepare us for the next time? You know, I thought we were prepared after the last pandemic, the H1N1, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, that was huge. That infected 50 to 60 million people in the United States, and it killed about you know 50,000 people. Uh, so I would have thought after that one we would have been better prepared, but apparently we weren't, right? Um, I think there's a couple of things. I think we've realized that we have to move quicker. Uh, I think we have to be more nimble, flexible, if you will. And by that, I'm talking about the government, you know, and what I think one of the things that everybody's criticized, and, and I agree, is the testing has been uh, poor. Uh, I think we got behind the testing, way behind the testing. That has got to change. You know, as I've said before, you know, we are in a, in a 2020 pandemic, you know, and we're still using, you know, guidelines from the 1950s. So I think we have to improve the flexibility uh, of our government response, not only at the federal level, but also at the local level as well. And I just don't think we move fast enough uh, to this. Um, I think once we start to increase our testing, uh, I think we're going to see that the case fatality rates to this coronavirus is probably what it is to influenza. However, we're not going to be there uh, if we can't do some massive testing. France's parliament votes next week on plans to use a controversial tracing app to help fight the coronavirus as the country eyes easing its own lockdown next month. From Paris, Lisa Bryant reports that, like elsewhere in Europe, such apps have sparked privacy concern. French digital affairs minister Cédric O says the downloadable app would notify smartphone users when they cross people with COVID-19, with that information helping authorities to reduce the spread of the pandemic. In a video on the ruling party's La République en Marche's Facebook page, O says the so-called Stop COVID app will fully respect people's liberties. He says it will be completely voluntary and anonymous. And he says it will be temporary, lasting only so long as the pandemic. The government wants to launch the app on May 11th, the date it has set to begin easing a two-month lockdown here. It initially announced a parliamentary debate on the technology, but that's been changed to a vote after a major pushback from lawmakers. The app's critics include ruling party members like Guillaume Chiche. Chiche told French TV the app would reveal people's health status and lead to discrimination and exclusion. He's not the only one worried. We think that it is very dangerous for the government to say to French people that the solution will be this kind of application. Benoit Piedalou is a member of La Quadrature du Net, an advocacy group defending digital rights and freedoms. He lists a raft of potential problems, from chances the app could infringe on individual liberties to whether it can actually work effectively. We think that the digital application is not the correct answer to this problem. The government should buy masks. Uh, the government should open uh, new hospitals. There is a lot of other solutions than uh, an application. 
A recent poll showed 8 in 10 French respondents said they would be willing to download the app. But Piedalou believes the numbers of those actually using it will likely be a lot smaller. And many seniors who are among the most vulnerable to coronavirus don't have smartphones. France isn't the only European country working on tracing apps and sparking similar rights debates, including in neighboring Germany. Reports say the French government is also pushing Apple to allow the app to work on its iPhones without built-in privacy measures. Lisa Bryant for VOA News, Paris. Kenya's president, Uhuru Kenyatta, has vowed to arrest and punish 50 people who escaped mandatory coronavirus quarantines at an isolation center in Nairobi. Some Kenyans who were forced to isolate in government facilities have complained about high fees to stay at the center. Well, the pandemic's lockdown has not been good for many businesses, but one that has benefited is sales of alcoholic beverages. And while liquor and beer sales in the U.S. have gone up, smaller craft beer brewers whose popularity had been dramatically rising in recent years are now in danger of being tapped out. Joining us to talk more about it is reporter Chris Morris, who has been following the story. Chris, I guess even though beer and liquor sales are way up, small uh, craft brewers are really struggling. The craft beer industry over the last several years has sort of been exploding. Uh, You've seen a lot of growth, and as of uh, right now, there are 8,150 craft breweries in the country. That's kind of a loose definition. It can be anything from Samuel Adams to that little small brewery around the corner from you. The majority are the smaller ones like that. And what's happening right now is the craft brewers of America are seeing a massive drop in business, and we could see thousands closing sometime within the next six months. Any idea how widespread that would be? It really depends. The Brewers Association, which is sort of the trade organization for craft brewers, put out a survey uh, in the last week or so saying with current costs and revenues and everything with the, with the social distancing measures that are going on, how long can you last? 2% said I'm closing right now. 12% said no more than four weeks. Uh, 45%, over 45% said they can only last three months. Mm. Now, if it is that 45% that do, do shut down, that's 3,735 craft brewers throughout the country. Wow, that's just in the U.S. Yes, correct. Why are they having to shut down? Is there no other way they are able to compensate in some other way? Small craft breweries tend to make most of their money from foot traffic. People come in. They like the experience of tasting things in the tap room and that's where they make their money and a few distribute on kind of a a local level but not that much also they make a lot of their money from draft sales to restaurants and bars and because there are no restaurants and bars open anywhere those sales are off and because of social distancing the tap rooms are closed so they're making just a very very small percentage of their income right now the average craft brewery has seen its sales drop at least 65 percent a lot more seeing in the 70s at this point shifting a little bit here we heard heard a lot about Corona beer sales slumping over the coronavirus. I, what are you hearing about that? That was a fun story that some people bid on, but it actually isn't true. That survey that came out saying that people were blaming a Corona beer for coronavirus or cutting back on buying it, that came out right at the end of February or so of this year. And Bart Watson, who is the chief economist of Brewers Association, did some digging. He said he found out that sales over the past four weeks were up 3% actually, and about over 3% for the year before that. So really no effect. Corona, like Budweiser and Bud Light and some of the other big national chains, they make most of their sales in stores. And like you said at the beginning, people are buying beer and wine and spirits right now because they're trapped at home and you buy them in stores. So Corona is not suffering. Corona is doing just fine to this, yes. That was in February. So where do Corona beer sales stand now? Well, they're doing pretty good. They're still on the shelves, but it is worth noting that Grupo Modelo, which is an Anheuser-Busch subsidiary, they're the group in Mexico that makes Corona. They also make Modelo and Pacifico beers. They were deemed non-essential by the Mexican government. And so they are supposed to remain closed for the end of this month. Now they're trying to be qualified as essential and uh, get back to work. But there actually was a rush in Mexico for Corona beer when that order came down. But here in the U.S., there's still plenty of adequate, plenty of supplies. 
Reporter Chris Morris, thank you so much for being with us. Here are some of the other stories we are following at VOA. Health officials say two people died with the new coronavirus in California weeks before the first reported death from the virus. Santa Clara County officials said the people died at home February 6th and 17th. Canadian police are facing mounting criticism for using social media and not a provincial emergency alert system to notify the public that a gunman was at large for some 13 hours after he murdered the first of his 22 victims over the weekend. It was the worst mass shooting in the country's history. President Donald Trump said Wednesday that he has instructed the U.S. Navy to fire on any Iranian ships that harass it at sea a week after 11 vessels from Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy came dangerously close to American ships in the Gulf. Close interactions with Iranian military vessels were not uncommon in 2016 and 2017. Stay with VOA for all the latest world headlines. Federal officials in the U.S. say they have now seen the first confirmed virus cases in house pets. AP Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports. Two pet cats in New York State are thought to have gotten the virus from people in their households or at neighborhoods. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says there's no indication animals can transmit the virus to people, but it does appear some animals can get the virus from humans. The CDC recommends keeping cats inside and dogs away from dog parks. Pet owners with COVID-19 should wear masks around their animals and avoid touching them. The two New York State cats are expected to recover. Sagar Magani will be known. That does it for our show today, but you can always find us at voanews.com. On behalf of our producer, Jackson Wunganyi, I'm Lori London in Washington. Thanks so much for listening. Please take care of yourselves and be 